first time I was at the Stanford campus, I was slightly angry that nobody tell, told me that this place existed. So it's cool to have, uh, to have some business here. I'm, uh, I would have loved to be a student here, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to give this lecture. Um, we, uh, GitLab's mission is to make it so that everyone can contribute. And what we, what we make is a DevOps platform, a single application that allows you to do everything from planning what you want to build, create it, package that up, secure it, deploy that, and monitor what you've built. And there's a couple of things driving DevOps going from multiple tools to a single application. There's more and more software, there's more and more applications, there's more and more tools to help you in the DevOps process, and there's more and more a need to quickly onboard people and make developers happy. If you look at the number of tools in the beginning, DevOps, you could do it with some Git, some version control, some CI. Today it's 10 plus applications. If you look at old applications, there were a few big projects that a company had. Nowadays you have microservices, you have hundreds of different applications. And together that's, that's causing an exponential growth in the number of integrations. In the beginning companies said, hey, any team can bring their own tools, can use their own tools. Because when DevOps was new, it was very important to shift to newer, more modern tools really quickly. But it kind of caused a mess uh, because people, teams couldn't communicate across um, because they were on the different tool stacks. So companies said, we're going to standardize on best in class. As a company, we're going to pick the 10 tools we're going to use. We're going to use Jira for planning, GitHub for version control, Jenkins for CI, JFrog Artifactory for packaging, etc. That really helped. Everyone was on the same tool set. But what didn't go very fast is the cycle time. The cycle time is the time between deciding to do something and getting it out there. And that didn't go very fast because you, because you had to hop between these different tools. So the company said, you know what? We're going to make these integrations better so that you lose less context in between these hops. And then that's the era of DIY DevOps. This is where 80% of all companies are now. If you're going to work at a company, they say we have best in class tools. And you know what? We spent the last five years integrating them better. We have our own kind of, they typically have a really uh, fancy name for it. And also, typically, it's a worse experience than you'd have otherwise, because it really allows them to constrain things. But it it is a really big effort to make something like this. And every company is kind of making it themselves, doing the integrations themselves. And you never kind of get the tools quite right. All the tools have different concepts, different models. They don't quite fit. So you try to kind of duct tape something together, but it, the end result looks pretty messy. GitLab is the next phase. It's a DevOps platform, a single application where the same concepts are used throughout the application, where you don't have to switch from one interface to another interface, where you don't have it that your colleague doesn't have access to the same tool or the same credentials. And it allows you to go 10 times faster. We typically see that the cycle time is reduced. At T-Mobile, they were able to deploy 10 times as frequently with GitLab. At Goldman Sachs, they went from two weeks to two hours to make an improvement in their most important application. Apart from making a DevOps platform, we're also known as the largest remote company before the pandemic. I think now that after the pandemic, it's, it feels very natural that you can work remote. It used to be very controversial. Um, and for us, we were one of the first companies that didn't have a headquarter. Our headquarters was in a, a mailbox somewhere in a UPS store. I think um, sometimes people refer to us as a virtual company, and I always find that pretty funny. I find it funny because a company inherently is an abstract concept, right? Your company doesn't, doesn't consist of your furniture or your, your building. If anything, it maybe consists of your people, uh, but probably also of your processes and your systems and uh, the data and the, the relationships you have. But, but certainly, the headquarters of, of anything would matter the least, not, not the most. 
I think because we're, there was a lot of skepticism about being an old remote company, we paid extra attention to defining our culture. All the people said, like, how, how, if you're all remote, can you create culture? How can you create camaraderie? Um, culture, I think, but uh, I'd, I'd love to know if I'm missing one of these, so please add, but I think it consists of three things. What are your, what are your values? What is your camaraderie? And I think a big part of that is, is, is trust and friendship within the, within the people at the company. And how do you work? And we've been very intentional about all three. Uh, we have 22 ways in which we reinforce our values. We explicitly have programs to promote um, kind of meeting each other. I'd like to say we, we formalize informal communication. If you have a company that's co-located, the informal communication happens at the water cooler or here at the campus. If you are remote, it needs to happen in some other way, and we have a bit more intention around that. Um, we've shared over 15 ways in which we, you can help that uh, informal communication. And then a company, a, a part of culture is how you work, what you do. And we've been trying to get uh, really, uh, maybe thoughtful, maybe prescriptive almost about that. We think there's, there's better ways to work so that you spend less time on communication on average. We all like to do a great job at work and all like to have a little bit time left and the only way to get there is to be more efficient and I don't think um, that intuition or what people naturally do is necessarily always optimal. I think there's ways to further improve it, and I think companies can be more opinionated on how you communicate. An example would be at GitLab, we don't present in meetings. We think that can happen async. If you want to present, great, send the slide deck up front. If you want to verbalize it, great, send the video up front. But give people the opportunity to watch it at a time of their choosing, maybe at twice speed, instead of doing this, where we made you show up and, and then present. But I think the had a being here synchronous should be for Q&A, so it was great to see that there's a lot of time for that today. We have um, six values, of which the most important ones are results, transparency, and iteration. And I'll, I'll go um, through them uh, later on. We, we also have made something called Team Ops. It's a couple of months old right now, and it's because a lot of things we thought were very logical doing when you were remote uh, didn't turn out to be very much connected to being remote. It's more connect, connected to like making the fish, uh, decisions and we think a more efficient and inclusive way. So we, we thought of four principles for team ops. The first one is a shared reality, making sure everyone is on the same page. And we do that in a couple of ways. At GitLab, things are public by default. For example, if you uh, type in GitLab unfiltered, you'll find a YouTube channel with a ton of boring meetings. So if you have trouble falling asleep tonight, you can uh, go to a wide selection of meetings. But it just, it does reach more people. Like if you miss the meeting, it's very easy to see it. Um, it's on YouTube, so you can watch it on any device. And if you plan on interviewing at GitLab and you wonder what reality is like, that is a really great way to see it. We try to have a single source of truth. I think in a lot of organizations, information is duplicated. And if you duplicate it, it's really hard to update it later. You tend to update only one part and it gets out of sync. So if you look, at, for example, at our handbook of over 2,000 pages, you'll find a lot of times things are links that could also be, have been there, but we intentionally link so we don't duplicate the information. We try to practice low context communication. If we are synchronous, you can be very fast. Like I do a ton of meetings and they're efficient for me because I can say the minimum. And if people are like this, I can elaborate a little bit more. Um, if we 
communicate, for example, to the entire company, we, we try to give context on, on what is going on uh, and provide like backup materials whenever possible. We pay a lot of attention to situational leadership. Um, I think I have a, a blog post out there with over 13 factors that might factor in of whether you delegate something or not. I think if, if you become a, a leader uh, of any, any sort from manager, uh, manager up, it's really important that you adjust your communication to your audience. And it's gonna be different for different people at different times depending on the situation. Um, we're, we're an inclusive company. We try to make sure that people can contribute. And maybe one, I won't call it trivial, but as a simple way in which we do it, is that in meetings, we write down if you wanna ask the next question. So there's a Google Doc, it's real time. The agenda kind of becomes the notes during the meeting and you can write down your name and your question. Because if people talk, sometimes some people find it hard to kind of interrupt or, or kind of quickly raise, raise their voice. And this, this allows us to kind of be um, more on an equal playing field between the different personality types we found. And having shared values and, and reinforcing that in 20 different ways. The second thing, apart from a shared reality, is making sure that everyone can contribute. It's, it's our mission, um, and there's a lots of ways in which we try to do that. One way is iteration. So we try to make work as small as possible and then get it out as quickly as possible. So reducing scope to get it out quicker. Uh, that sounds maybe easy. It's, it's by far the hardest thing we do. And it's the only value where I regularly hold office hours because lots of times the way to do that is not intuitive to, uh, to people and frankly to ourselves. Like I, I frequently get like, hey, sit, this, this can probably be smaller. And if you make something smaller and get it out quickly, it allows people to respond to that. The longer, the bigger chunk of work you're gonna ship the longer it takes before you can incorporate people, their feedback. Another uh, operating principle we have is short toes. Um, and that means that anyone in the company can give you a suggestion about what to do. And not all of them are gonna be great suggestions, but they're always welcome. You don't have to listen to them. You don't even have to acknowledge them. We do, we do think you should read them, so read them, but you don't have to uh, defend yourself. I think if you, if you start requiring that, like where people acknowledge the contributions, that's a lot of work. And then people will st make sure that their projects stay under the radar so that they don't get as much feedback. Um, a few other things are the DRIs, making sure that there's, for every project, there's one accountable person. Um, informal communication, for example, this uh, quarter we had visiting grants um, where people got 500 to $1,000 to meet up together. Um, and we always try to distinguish one-way door and two-way door decisions. Um, a one-way door decision is something that's very hard to reverse. Uh, a typical example of that is a, a rename or a pricing decision. Most decisions in companies are two-way doors. Like you, if, if it's really a bad idea, you can reverse course and it, it doesn't it doesn't impact too much and if you realize that it's easier to try something out that people suggest the third team ops principle is decision velocity I think a company this the speed of progress in a company is very much correlated to the speed of making decisions um, we try to combine the best of a hierarchical and a consensus organization. I think typically people thought you had to choose. Either you are hierarchical, top down, and very fast at making decisions, but not always very informed. Consensus is the opposite. Everyone participates in the decision-making process. They're gonna be very informed decisions, but it tends to slow things down. It's, 
if you institute a consensus making out uh, decision process, you have two things happening. Fewer decisions happening and people trying to stay under the radar so that other people can start chiming in, slowing down their work. At GitLab, we say, look, the, the kind of the, the part of the decision where we get opinions and get data, everyone can come participate. But the person who does the work, or maybe their manager, they make the decision. And all these people who chimed in, they shouldn't have, they shouldn't be upset if they didn't even get acknowledged for their contribution. It is the flip side of being able to voice your opinion that it won't always be acknowledged. Because if we require people to acknowledge it and defend it and everything else, we're gonna see fewer decisions and we're gonna see things flying under the radar. And I think it, it's, it's very much misunderstood as a trade-off. I think you can have the best of both worlds. Decisions should be taken at the lowest possible level. Now, I'm involved with decisions every day, so apparently we're not always able to do that, but we try to, try to do that as much as we can. We try to reduce uh, politics in a couple of ways. Uh, we try to say why, especially in our handbook when we encode a decision, like this is how we operate, it's important that you have the why there because the, it might, times might change and if you don't know the why, you never know when to change the underlying thing. We try to work asynchronous as much as possible. We try to embrace boring solutions. Um, there's a lot of, I think, computer science people here. They like new technologies and that's great and we encourage people using them. We don't encourage people bringing their hobbies into our product because our mission is everyone can contribute and that's only possible if everyone understands what they're building upon. So if you make a layer in the product that is very novel and very interesting, it's gonna be hard for other people to build on top of that. So we try to avoid that whenever possible. And we try to reduce constraints. The more constraints you have, the more gates, the slower things are gonna go. And the last part of team ops is, is clarity of, of measurement and, and of execution. We don't have a matrix organization. A matrix organization is where you report to a functional boss and kind of a project type of manager. If you have two managers, it's gonna be really, really hard to make, get decisions done and uh, have a clear sense of career progress and the things tend to get political. We measure results and not hours. I think there's still a lot of um, presenteeism. Um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, but companies focusing on people showing up. Like if you are very visible, if you come in early and you leave late, they assume you do good work. If you measure those things, you're definitely gonna see people doing that. Except it's not the goal of the company to do that. So for example, GitLab, as a manager, you're not allowed to talk with one of your reports about how many hours they worked, unless you suspect they worked too many hours. We always wanna make sure the focus is on the result. And we discourage managers for sometimes praising an effort. Um, because if, if we start celebrating kind of people spending a ton of time on something, you're gonna, you're gonna get that. And we, do, we wanna spend the minimal amount of time getting the maximum result. I think transparent measurements is also very important for everyone to know kind of what page they're on. In engineering, we, for example, measure merge request rate. How many pieces of code did you get into production considering the size of your team. We measure that at the team level to encourage collaboration. And we don't really, we don't just, on a, on a kind of an engineering level, we don't just measure what our engineering group shipped as a whole, but we include outside contributions. Hundreds of improvements in GitLab every quarter are made by users and customers. They help us improve the product and they, they work on the same level as us. So. We don't just share our roadmap publicly, even our work in progress. We had an engineer start at GitLab and say, who's, who's this kind of product manager telling me what to do? And 
it wasn't a product manager, it was a customer who really cared about the feature they were writing and were following that in real time as they were uh, making commits. And it was funny when we started measuring MR rate, our engineer said like, hey, it's gonna be really simple. I can just make smaller changes and I'll, I'll get a higher rate. And we we're like, yes, that's exactly what you should do because we know the smaller you make it, the easier it is to review, the lower the odds it will blow up production, the easier it is to make fixes and, and change things. Every, every change should add some value for the end user, should add some functionality or something else, but please make it as small as you can because overall we're gonna be more productive as an organization. We prioritize due dates over scope. For example, new version of self-managed GitLab ships every month on the 22nd. And we've hit that for as long as we existed, ever since the first release. That's now 130 releases in a row because that train just goes. And it really, because that is the case, people know that it, it, it brings predictability. Think people know when something ships. It also helps people reduce scope because they know that train is going to go, so they reduce scope in order to make the train. We have a value that's disagree, commit, and disagree. We love disagreements because otherwise there's too many people in the meeting. Then at some point, the DRI is going to make a decision, and we expect everyone to execute on that and implement it. But that doesn't mean that from then on you cannot disagree further. The execution should happen, but you can keep arguing for a different decision. The best decision it made in GitLab history was a case of disagree, commit, and disagree. Um, there was an engineer called Camille, and he said, we should combine our version control and our CI, our uh, verify functionality, into a single application. And uh, Dimitri, my co-founder, said, obviously not. Um, that is technically complex uh, and, and no other tool does it that way. And I said, obviously not. Our customers do not want that in a single tool. They want composability. They want Unix principles, compose different tools. So we disagree and Camille committed and he added value to the product, but he kept coming back. And at some point we relented um, and it was the best decision in, in our history. Uh, we started, it st set us on a path of making a DevOps platform. And it was so not intuitive that our, our competitors took years to, to catch up to the same thing. And we are now ahead. We have the most comprehensive DevOps platform, all because Camille kept disagreeing with us. Last thing we do is uh, key review meetings. Um, normally, you have a report communicating up to a manager about your work and what you did. I am the only one that's working very cross-functionally. Like, of course, people in the company work with other functions, but my reports are, have had all the different, represent all the different functions in GitLab. And instead of presenting to me, they present to a group of people. And it's called a key me a review meeting, they say, hey, here's the three things top of mind for me, things I'd like to, I think we should discuss. Here's how we're doing according to our OKRs, our goals for the quarter. And here's how we're doing according to our KPIs, the metrics that are always important. And we do that as a group. And it, it brings a lot of accountability, but also a lot of transparency of what is going on. And it helps the, the whole kind of e-group and, and other people um, be on the same page. And then we repeat that presentation. We, we, we give those materials and that agenda, we give them to the entire company. And we have a group conversation where anyone in the company can join. GitLab is now 1,700-ish people, about 80 people join. And their, their questions are less sharp than the ones in the key meeting. And that's not their manager, their peers, but it is a lot of questions for clarification, people who want to understand. And that's, it really helps to keep the whole company kind of informed of everything going on, allowing them to make better decisions in their departments. If you're interested in team ops, we, uh, we do a certification. It's free, uh, it takes about an hour. Um, 
and I, I encourage you to do so. I think um, what's happening in our industry right now, according to Gartner, the adoption of DevOps platforms is now less than 20%, but they see it tripling in the next three years. So we're looking forward to kind of the industry switching from multiple tools to an integrated tool. What we also see is DevOps, model ops, and data ops converging. Every significant application of the future will have machine learning. It will have code that emits data. You train models on it and it informs how the code executes. Right now, those are completely different pipelines, different ways of working, different tool stack. Just like DevOps brought development, security, and operations together, I think uh, there's, a, there's a role for having an integrated platform for that significant application where those things work together instead of separate. And we're adding ML ops and data ops functionality to GitLab. I read a lot of great questions, so I hope we have ample time for that. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? A question. I'm kind of curious whether you can comment on, um, and I know this isn't exactly the same as, as what GitLab does, but um, whether there is an intention to do something similar. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is what's going on right now with GitHub and their development of Copilot and their use of basically you know, taking all the code that's on their platform and utilizing it for an external service that they're selling. Um, I wonder if you, or I'm wondering if you had like an opinion as to like how you feel about that in terms of what it spells for the industry, what it spells you know, for you know, software development in general and the legality of, of the whole situation um, as it pertains to GitLab and again, the industry as a whole. Thanks. Uh, yeah, question is what I think of GitHub Copilot. Uh, GitHub Copilot is a code suggestion tool. Uh, it's trained on code that is, some of it is open source licensed, some of it um, might not be licensed in a way you'd intuitively, th you, you, you can copy it. Uh, but what Copilot does is, is not necessarily copying it, it's using it to train and then based on training it does something. And I think that's the debate, is this copying or is this like teaching a student and then the student, yes, has, has ideas in the future. And I think uh, over the coming months and years, we're, we're going to see people uh, argue about that, and, and uh, that's going to bring more clarity. I think it's uh, it's a it's a useful tool. Code suggestions make a ton of uh, ton of sense, and we're working on those. Um, we think that there's lots of areas in which um, a DevOps platform can benefit from AI and ML, and uh, the feature we released doesn't help an individual coder work faster, but it helps with the, the overall speed, the cycle time. And it's, it, it helps you determine who should I uh, assign this code review to. Because if you look at speeding up the time between making something and getting it out there, most of the time isn't lost because people cannot type fast enough. Most of the time is lost because you assign it to the wrong person who doesn't have expertise on that part of the code base and then it's kind of stuck there for days. So um, we're focused um, on making GitLab better. We'll have code suggestions too, but um, um, we'll also do other things to, to make the app better. Apart from that, we wanna make sure that GitLab gets, gets better for ML ops. And we're starting there too with small functionality. What we just released is the ability to use uh, ML flow to inform an experiment in GitLab, link the two together. Publish the handbook, and you also mentioned the public by default. So I would like to hear more about the rationale behind making a lot of information public. Yeah, why do we make so much public? Um, it started because we started a for-profit company around an open source project. And what typically happens is the amount of contributions goes down. And I thought if we are very open about how, what we do as a company, but also how the company functions, who are there, who's responsible for what. Um, we're gonna 
better be able to, to have the wider community kind of join in that journey and also call us out when something goes, goes astray. And that worked. Maybe correlation is not causation, but we have more contributions now than we had than when we started the company. What we discovered over time is that it really became a way for us to attract talent. Um, people, I recently had an interviewer say, look, I looked at your handbook and I, I feel like corporate soulmates now. Um, might be stating it a, 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 a bit uh, definitive, but um, a lot of people say, look, I looked at your handbook and this is the, w the I, I can sympathize with that. This is the way I want to work. There's also probably some people who I never speak to or like look at our handbook and say, I'm, I'm not a fit for this company. And I think that's fine too. I think it's always a bit curious when a company doesn't tell you their strategy, but day one you show up, they tell you the strategy and they expect you to be totally aligned with their strategy and way of working. Well, you should have told me before I joined. And I, I think it's, it's a way to see whether, whether you're a good fit. And I think companies used to be constrained to a certain metro area. So you kind of had to be appealing to everyone. It's no longer the case. Uh, we can hire, we have people in 60 countries. We just need a few people to be really excited about GitLab. And um, recently we've seen that it also now started to lead to customers being more interested in us. And people say like, hey, yeah, I compared you to what we are DOI DevOps. And one reason to switch was your transparency. Thanks. I'm curious about your name, about the company. Is it a tip of the hat to get to get done on GitHub? Yeah, for sure, the name. Um, when uh, Git was made by uh, Linus Trovolz, he also made Linux. Um, and uh, in English, a Git is an unpleasant person. So he, he, he joked that he, he named both his projects after himself. <laughs> um, Git came with something that's called Git Web. It was a way, it was written in C. You could run it locally to have a, a web view of your repositories. You couldn't do anything, but you could kind of browse them. GitHub came after that, and GitLab came after that. So we all trace back to Git. Um. I was wondering, you were talking about like your hardest job is reducing the size of work that gets shipped. Um, yeah, like, can you talk more about like some frameworks that you use that, uh, that, that help you with that? Things that, like, like changes in how you do that uh, over the years? Yeah, the, the question is about the iteration value. How do you do that? Um, I think one thing to recognize is that it comes from a really good place to want to do something broad in scope. Uh, just like most of you, um, the people at GitLab are very ambitious. Like they want to achieve a lot. And they start thinking about something impactful and meaningful to do and all the things they could do. And they come up with a big plan to do something. And then it's really hard to kind of whittle this down to a thing that is so small in scope that you're almost ashamed to ship it. And it's, it's not intuitive, it's not particularly pleasant, um, and it sometimes takes almost an external view to do that. So if you Google GitLab iteration office hours, you'll, you'll see a bunch of YouTube videos of us discussing these projects together. And sometimes we're able to reduce them in scope and sometimes it's not possible um, it's different solutions and most of the time it's like, okay, can you drop that requirement without kind of, well, while still having a positive impact? Okay, I just was looking at your uh, corporate handbook and um, what's the CEO of Shadow Group? Yeah, thanks for asking. The CEO Shadow Program that you asked about is um, people being in about 80% of my meetings. It's two shadows at a time, we graduate between 30 and 40 people. And I had at a certain time the realization that I see a lot of the company in my meetings. I see all the different functions. And 
we're a functionally organized company. So the hardest thing in the company, if you're there, is to look outside your function. And I had this great perspective. Um, and we decided to open it up to people. At first, we did uh, three weeks. I was inspired by medical tradition of see one, do one, teach one. Um, but we, uh, it was the shorter the better uh, because people are taken away from their day job. It's a full-time program and we've made it smaller. And um, if you Google GitLab CEO shadows, you'll, you'll find what people say about it, but it tends to give them a lot of insight in how the company's operating, how we work, and they're able to bring that back to their job and a function and kind of be better at that. I, I secretly, and not so secretly, also hope that that's gonna inspire some people to uh, maybe start their own companies in the future. It also inspired some people to definitely not start their co own company in the future. And uh, I think both, uh, both are good, good outcomes. So related to that, there's this notion of uh, situational leadership, which most of the time requires cross-functional view. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, thanks. The, the question is uh, situational leadership And it's a, it's a big subject that could be a lecture all right. in and of itself. Um, here are the, and, and situa situational leadership is much broader than just delegation. Um, but as an example, here are the 19 factors that I sometimes, I don't do this every, for every decision, but I sometimes on delegating something, I consider one of these things. What is the experience level of the report? What are the skills required? What is my own skill? Like how good am I at this? How important is this? How urgent is this? And urgency and importance are different things. Uh, um, how many opportunities will I have to provide feedback? How many times can we, can we make improvements? And you can, you can read the rest. I think um, if you're a good leader, sometimes you are, you are delegating and it's almost like you're not there and they're, they're completely on their own. Sometimes you're, delega you're not delegating at all. You're micromanaging, you're on top of it. And probably both styles are called for in different situations and everything in between it. So it's a really big decision like, okay, how much follow-up do I require? In what way, etc. Uh, for example, frequently I'll give feedback and say, hey, this is good to go, you can publish it, please consider this additional thing. That way that person is unblocked, I'm no longer a gate, and they can decide whether to take my advice or not. If it's bad advice, they can just ignore it. Um, but that's, it. if you wanna have an impact, you gotta motivate people to, to do things, you gotta make sure they deliver good work and if you want to micromanage everything, you're not going to get anywhere. But if you, if you delegate everything to an ex extent that you don't have control, or you have very little opportunity for feedback, that's also not appropriate if, if it's a very important task. So you go first. How did you identify the need for GitLab to exist when you were creating the company? And then how did you go about creating the first version? Yeah, why, why, how did GitLab start existing? Um, my co-founder, Dimitri, uh, was uh, working and he needed a tool to collaborate. He would uh, like to have purchased GitHub at the time, but there was no budget. Being a programmer, he said, okay, well, there's no money, but how hard can it be? I'll just build my own version of it. And uh, in the first year, 300 people contributed to that effort. I saw it then, it was on uh, Hacker News. And I thought, this makes so much sense that something you collaborate with is something you can also contribute to. And I uh, did a show hacker news of, hey, I'm going to run this as a service. You don't have to download it anymore. You can just log in to GitLab.com. A year later, I ha was not making any money with GitLab.com, but I had all these Silicon Valley companies that reached out, like, we're running GitLab. Like, can you help us improve functionality and fix things that are wrong? And Dimitri tweeted to the whole world, I want to work on GitLab full time. 
So send them an email like, hey, I'm that person a year ago who told you, hey, I'm gonna start GitLab.com without you, hope you don't mind, to which he replied, great, go for it, it's open source, that's the whole idea. Uh, but I saw your tweet, maybe, maybe we can partner up, maybe I can uh, make sure you, uh, you get a monthly income, we agreed on a monthly income, I went to the local Western Union money office in the Netherlands and uh, they said, money to, the, to Ukraine, no. Oh. Do you know this person or is this someone you met over the internet? Because <laughs> they were very afraid I was being scammed, but I uh, was quite convinced he was the real deal, and he was, and a year later we uh, incorporated, a year later we participated in Y Combinator 2015. We were seven, eight people at the time, and uh, yeah, that we were three months in a home in uh, Mountain View, $24,000 for three months. I still remember thinking that was a lot of money. And um, yeah, classic kind of laptops in the living room. And uh, we raised money and off to the, off to the races. So what, what was the first product that you were, were selling going from the open source version previously? Yeah, the first product we were selling. I don't remember, um, but after a while we noticed a pattern. We were looking for a pattern in like what functionality was open source and what was proprietary. And we first thought maybe it's the size of the company that cares about it. No. Nah. Maybe it's the maturity of the company that cares about it. No. Nah. We tried a couple of things and then we found it. It's not any of those. It's who cares about it most. Is it an individual contributor? Is it the developer, security, or operations person? Or is it an executive at the company? If it's an executive, it's gonna be paid. If it's an individual contributor, it's gonna be open source. And we call that buyer-based open core. And if you Google buyer-based open core, you'll, you'll find a talk I did at a heavy bit that explains it a bit more in depth. Uh, how do you guys um, think about like, what, your, what like, your core IP is? Um, or if, and, and, and since it's open source provided it's such a big <coughs> company, um, if, if it's not IP, if it's not anything like patent or anything, like what, 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 what is it? What is our core IP? It is the proprietary functionality of GitLab. So GitLab is open core. That means some of it is open source, some of it is proprietary. You gotta get a subscription with GitLab to use it. Now, one thing is very unlike proprietary software that you're used to. Even the proprietary code is out there. You can download it, you can legally modify it, you can send us contributions. It's just that in order to legally use it, you need to get a license with us. Uh, how do you get new employees to adopt and internalize GitLab's culture? Yeah, how do we get new employees uh, onboarded with, with all these things? Many different ways. I just did a call today for new people who, uh, who joined us in the recent weeks, and, and we talked. Uh, basically, it's them asking me questions. It's an AMA. We also have a pretty extensive onboarding. If you Google GitLab onboarding, you'll find a page, and if you click through, you'll find a template you'll find in that template is over 200 tasks that have to be performed. And one thing I personally really like, it's not just the task you have to perform, but also the task your manager has to perform, finance, people ops, etc. So if they're not doing their part of it, you know it. It's not something that surprises you six months down the road when you need access that, to that one system. Um, and there's a lot of reading and, and taking tests in that. There's also things like coffee chats, where we require you to have coffee chats with five people, where you have a Zoom meeting of 25 minutes with someone you haven't talked to before. No agenda, can talk about work or life outside of work, but to make it normal to have kind of that water cooler talk in an online company. Hi, and um, thank you for coming. So, um, I guess you put a lot of thought into building the culture of the North Pole. And I think after COVID, we saw a spike in the number of companies and startups. 
that are trying to solve some of the pain points under the future of war. So I was just wondering, what do you see as the biggest pain point that you today would like to see that companies try to solve? Yeah, the question is what um, pain points can be solved. There, there's so many companies trying to contribute to making remote better. First of all, I'm very grateful for some of the tools we use besides GitLab, uh, Zoom, Slack. That's, that's really a game changer. I think um, the hardest thing is to work handbook first. So we, at a typical company, if you look at their handbook, it doesn't contain everything. It contains lots of stuff that's out of date. It has lots of overlap and everything else. And the way we prevent that is in GitLab, if you want to communicate a change, you have to change the handbook and say, hey, look, this is how I changed the handbook. Um, that is not intuitive. Um, people much rather send an email, a, give a PowerPoint, anything but actually changing the handbook. But if you're able to kind of to have that happen, people can be more assured that what's in the handbook is actually the single source of truth and, and consult it. But that's, that's been hard. Um, I think it's also really important that when changing the handbook, there's a difference between who makes the suggestion and who approves it. If you make that the same, which is typical in a wiki, it becomes really hard because the, the people who approve it maybe don't have the time and the pe people who can make the change maybe are not uh, are not sure it's the right change and they want someone to review it. For you as a part one of the tenants, um, the company is to reduce politics and had emphasized uh, you know, understanding the why, why you have like a certain policy in the case that you need to change it, it should like the circumstances change. So what's the why and also in what circumstances do you imagine So what's the why behind that rule or can you, um, so what's the, uh, why is it important to give the why? So um, we try to always have it obvious why something exists so that when something no longer serves its purpose, it can be removed. I think you'll find that companies that existed for a longer time have more rules and more uh, things you need to comply with. And that can be maybe, yeah, you live, you learn. I think uh, now that I'm the age I am, I have more rules for myself than I was 20. So it kind of makes sense. But also, you tend to overdo it a bit. And every time there's a problem, kind of introduce a new rule. So it's important to weed those out and to allow people to challenge that. Um, and I'm thinking of making it even kind of a job requirement and maybe kind of something that factors into promotions, like how much, how, mu how many rules you were able to clean up and were able to address in different ways or were able to make a case that trying to prevent that mistake is worse from accepting that it sometimes will happen. Uh, if GitHub is our main competitor, I know that GitHub action is getting better in the last few years, so how does GitLab uh, create new features to compete against GitHub Actions and all the GitHub ecosystem. Yeah, the question is, how, how do we compete with GitHub? So, um, what we see as the bar for us is not um, GitHub, but it's the best-in-class competitor in every part of the space. Think of planning. Lots of companies still use Jira for planning. Um, we're now more and more able to replace that I think our version control, our CI is already really good. But we also want to make sure our package management is great. We're competing with JFrog Artifactory there. Our security, we're, not, we're competing with companies like Sneak and Checkmarks, uh, Veracode, et cetera. So making sure that in every single part of that whole workflow that goes all the way to releasing, monitoring, governance, and everything, you're, you become best in class over time. Because right now, some of the parts of GitLab are not as good as the best in class thing. So you have to make a compromise. Now, the compromise is probably GitLab right now. If you move to GitLab, you can consolidate spend. You don't have all these people working on integrations. They can move on and do something useful. People become more effective. 
and you're, you get to move faster on your biggest priorities. But I'd love for it not to be a trade-off and get both best in class and a single application. Final question. So, uh, you talked about the functional organization in the company and the situational leadership, but within each function, in terms of team dynamics, do you follow uh, like this concept of two pizza teams like Amazon started with? Or where do you choose to decide that a team is too big or too small? Yeah, when is a team too big? Um, we try to make sure that no manager has more than 10 reports. So every quarter we discuss the managers that have more than 10 reports and what the plan of action is for that. Because if, I think if typically 10, you don't have time to be a good mentor to all of your reports and be, be familiar with their work and everything else. Um, I think that's, that's one way to prevent it. I do think that smaller is sometimes beautiful. And one thing we have is incubation engineering, where we have what we call single engineer groups. It's a single person who is responsible for planning something, making something, promoting that to the outside world, and making that uh, happen. Um, and I think there's a team of one person can sometimes do remarkable things, because your team meetings are just in your head. Uh, and we try to stimulate that. And, kind of having that heritage of everyone can contribute and all these outside contributions allows that model to work much better than I think than it's possible in other companies. Can you talk a bit about the IPO? What were the trends at the time? And looking back, what were the learnings you had? Yeah, oh. IPO learnings. Um, actually, we published a blog post about a week ago. Well, it was October 14th um, on the anniversary of the IPO. And I think that contained a lot of the, the lessons we had. Um, I'm very grateful for kind of how well it went. It was one of the most perfect things that we did in our, our history. And uh, a big part of that is having an amazing GNA team. GNA is finance, people, uh, and legal. And those functions have to do a lot of the work for the IPO. And, um, Having very experienced people there who've gone through IPOs before was a, was a big part of the reason why it went so well. And um, I recommend the blog post. We, we've written up like more than 20 concepts that I didn't know about before we went into the process. I really admire you know, the move that you made. Like, you know, your philosophy are no offices, uh, you know, like remote first. What are the learnings, the things that you believe became harder because of distance, or the things that you haven't figured out how to do it with now? Yeah, that's what became harder about being remote first. Um, I think it became easier over time. And I think one thing is really interesting is that um, people kept asking, how does this old remote culture of you scale? And my retort to that is, how does an in-person culture scale? I get the benefit of being in one room, totally get it. But then you're no longer in one room, you're one floor, and you're multiple floors. Oh, first time I see you, I've been here three months, work on the 31st floor. Oh, oh yeah, cool. Different buildings, different cities, different metropolitan areas. Like, I can drone on a while. How do you scale that? Like, if the benefit is being in a room together, how does that scale? I don't understand it. And I don't think it does. I can tell you how written culture scales. You write it down once, people read it multiple times. That's worked for civilization. Now, the only thing I think is really important is that you reinforce certain things. How we do a presentation, that's much easier to communicate than what our values are. But in-person values, what happens to that? They get diluted as you hire more people. You sometimes like hire so many people that most of the people in the company were there for a very short time. We got 22 ways in which we reinforce our values. I've not met a company that has written down more than three ways in which they reinforce it. So I think, obviously, a written 
reinforce culture skills much better than counting on people being in the same room because, because that doesn't happen at scale. So you have a very structured way, right? Including, I'm, I'm impressed if I have to read that every single time. So how do you prevent this? You know, and I get like people join because they love the company, etc., and you get the best from everywhere. But how do you prevent that you're not getting only a certain type of person, that you're missing out diversity in a way of thinking, approaching things? Yeah, how do we make sure we're a diverse company? Um, especially when s things are so structured. Maybe let's start with the first thing. Uh, things are very structured. I, don't, I hope it doesn't come at the expense of unstructured thinking. Um, today, uh, we decided with the directs group to next meeting, invite my um, singing coach and we'll be doing tongue stretches and motorboats in the next meeting. So I'm looking forward to that. Our chief legal officer is also the chair of our practical joke committee, of which I'm expecting bigger output. But besides, besides that point, like it, it shouldn't come at the, we're not robots. The whole reason we have people is because all those written down rules are not enough. Um, and then how do you create diversity? Well. You institute it at every part of the company, and there, there's a lot that goes into it. One thing I thought was um, interesting is that if people apply to your company, obviously you cannot discriminate. But you can decide who you reach out to. Like for your outbound recruiting, you can reach out to whoever you want. And I think that's a big lever in increasing, uh, increasing the diversity of your team. And, uh, I'm super happy where we are in where we've the progress we've made in gender diversity at the company and we still have uh, our work cut out for us in for example uh, ethnicity uh, diversity Thanks for the presentation. And you were talking about um, how implicit c communication happens when you're in a room and that you are formalizing that. Um, what are, can you elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for that. How do you formalize informal communication? Um, let's see how look I, lucky I am with uh, Googling for that. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so so f maybe the first question. So how do you organize informal communication? Um, this on the right hand side is just the, uh, it's not the lexicon, what is it? The table of contents of this page. So I think there's more than f 15 ways in here that we sometimes practice to do that. The second part of your question is, how do you do that across time zones? Time zones are the bane of our existence. Like remote, there's no distance anymore, but time zones are extremely hard. Being a remote company is easy. Being a company across time zones is very, very hard. There's no ideal solutions. Sometimes important meetings we do twice so that uh, all our team members can attend. But still, if I talk to our Team members in Asia Pacific, they, they don't have as, as much interaction, as, as, as good of an experience as the people in uh, the US and Europe. Um, so it's very hard to do correctly. I don't have magical solutions to that. I do think there's certain things you can do asynchronous. I'm a big fan of sending small gifts to people. You can do that across time zones. But you're more likely to find out what the fun gift is if you're in a meeting together uh, and you spend a little time up front before the meeting starts uh, talking. So no big solutions for that. It's hard, but I think being intentional and allowing a GitLab, there's an agenda before and then people kind of evolve that agenda into notes. And so people got the chance to ask questions in the meeting, even if they will not be present themselves. And then they go, what's the, 
the notes or the recording afterwards to see what the answer was. Give us a scale of the company in terms of employees and in terms of time zone, in terms of growth rate and so on. Yeah, I'm sorry uh, for not doing that earlier. The scale of the company, it's about 1,700 people, a run rate of $400 million, uh, people across 60 countries. I don't know how many time zones, but basically around the world. Um, we're growing, uh, last quarter we were growing 74% year over year in revenue. Our non-GAAP operating margin was uh, 89%. And the last time we detailed our net retention, it was uh, over 152%. Net retention is a metric of how much do your existing customers spend with you the next year? In dollar terms. In dollar terms. And it's a good indication if it's high, especially if it's above 130, people really like what the product does for them. There's a question in the back. The presentation fascinating the way that you've um, approached this from a management perspective um, I'm curious with all of this material that's over there can you give some insight on what the sort of viewership or readership of all of these sort of policies is yeah, the question is how many people read our handbook and our, our, our materials um, I don't have that from the from the top of my head I think there was a little bit about um, So the previous, before Team Ops, many, many months ago, we um, talked about remote. Now that was extremely relevant at the time because of the global pandemic. But at the time, over 15,000 people download, downloaded our remote playbook. And I've heard that it got distributed in many companies. Uh, 40,000 people engaged with our course uh, on remote team management on Coursera. Coursera. So um, we reached a lot of people then. And, uh, we, uh, we try to reach a lot of people with team ups today. But this is everybody, right? This is employees and non employees. Um, yes. Although this will be 98% plus non team members. Can I know what is your view on DAO? Like, what is the decentralized autonomous? My view on what, sorry? Uh, the decentralized autonomous Oh, DAOs. Uh, so my view on DAOs, which is a type of crypto organization, I think, um, I think they're very impractically organized. I think even if you look at governments, you'll see that there's a voting power and there's kind of the government trying to do as best as they can uh, uh, while incorporating that voting. I think that split is not always super clear in DAOs and they've not been very successful so far. I, I do think that over time we're gonna get better at, at how these uh, organizations are organized. Given how thoughtful you are about management generally, I, I would think you'd have some interesting thoughts about how you like people in your company to give feedback. So I was wondering if you Okay. Yeah, how do, how do we give feedback at, at GitLab? Um, there's a lot written down. Hopefully you'll find some of it if you Google GitLab feedback. Um, a few things that come to mind, like give feedback early and often when it's still actionable. Uh, one book we recommend everyone reads is Crucial Conversations, and it's a way to give people feedback in a, uh, in a way that's easiest to um, incorporate for them. Uh, and I think that it's a very short book, so I really recommend that very highly. It's in our top three of books we recommend our, our leadership reads. <coughs> Any other questions? Or suggestions? Criticism? Anybody send a merch request yet to get one? Go ahead. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I don't think I misheard. <laughs> I asked whether someone sent a merch request, but if you have oh, a question, yeah. I sent a merge request, sorry, my bad. I have, it's a merge request. Cool. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get your take on the intersection between 
DAOs and open source. Do you see any like convergence in the future or? Intersection between DAOs, the, the crypto, crypto organized things and open source. Um, I'll give some other thoughts to get rid of the crypto questions, but I, I do appreciate it. Um, I think there's almost no overlap. I don't know of an open source project that, that's done by a DAO. Um, in open source projects, you've, you've been seeing two things happening. Um, either it's part of a foundation or the open source project is managed by a company. And a very successful foundation, for example, is the Linux Foundation, who's also running the CNCF, which is running Kubernetes. Yeah, Apache Foundation. There's a lot of them, and there's a couple who are really good and big. Um, that's one model. The other model is a company behind an open source uh, project. Think Elastic or Redis or GitLab. I think one thing that bothered me a little bit about uh, that model was that we've seen a, a few bait and switches happening, where the project was open source in the beginning. And then when the company gets to a certain scale and a certain awareness, they change the license. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that, how to prevent that. Also be thinking about that because I, I started a venture fund called Open Core Ventures. And we start companies around open source projects. But the makers of these open source projects said, look, I'm okay with starting a company. I'm just not okay with that bait and switch happening. And we looked at length at the license of open source. Many of our projects are like uh, permiss using permissive licenses like MIT. Um, and we couldn't find a way to incorporate it in the license. And then we realized it's not, it's not something to solve at the level of the license. It's something to solve at the charter of the company. So uh, last week, we uh, Open Core Ventures launched OPBC, the Open Core Ventures Public Benefit Company Charter. And it's a charter you can incorporate, and then you're beholden to kind of acting like a good player in open source. Everything from releasing the code of your tests to allowing benchmarking and a, lot, a bunch of other things. And not doing the bait and switch, not relicensing the project. And that brings a certain ac amount of accountability. If you're not doing that, you can get sued by anyone and they can sue for damages. And we hope with that to, to kind of help to bring kind of more trust to companies running open source projects. GitLab is not such a company today. We just introduced it. We, we just started the first company. But the response has been very, uh, very promising. And I, I've heard of multiple people considering uh, incorporating as such now. Could you, tell, last question. Last question. Could you tell a little bit more about our remote management of the employees? There is a lot of softwares, such as <coughs> staff and stuff and such. So what's your take on using this type of software in um, tech development? And do you have any suggestions or recommendations for entrepreneurs managing remote employees? Yeah. Uh, the, the question is about uh, managing people remotely and the software you need. My personal belief is that it's not so much about the software, it's much more about how you use the software. And I think even the kind of the default stack for a company um, that includes like Zoom, Google Docs, Slack, it's much more about how you use those tools than, um, than using special software for remote. Uh, for example, all the meetings at GitLab, they always have a Google Doc attached in the calendar invite. There's always an agenda there. And during the meeting, we start indenting that agenda and adding notes to it. People ask questions there so that it's clear who wants to ask a question next because that's kind of awkward in a remote environment sometimes. So it's about how you use it. Same with like recording a meeting. Like whenever possible, we try to live stream it to YouTube. Like there's not special software you need, but you do need a lot of kind of intentionality in the company to like, oh yeah, of course, we're good. this is yeah, no, nothing secret here. We can just live stream this to YouTube. It, it, takes, 
takes effort on the part of the organization to, to do that and get comfortable with that. Thanks. Thank you.